Welcome to The Defiant. I'm your host, Tegan Klein. Today, I'm joined by Mustafa, CEO and co-founder of Celestia Labs. 15 years after Satoshi, we finally have what a blockchain actually is. Celestia provides the ability to publish data and make sure that data is available. Celestia had what many are calling one of the best launches of 2023, and they are the first data availability layer live today. We get into how Mustafa built Celestia, other data availability layers in the space, how Celestia can be thought of as a bulletin board for computers with some cryptographic and economic assurances. So computers posting info so everyone can see it. It's so simple. It's an obvious fundamental building block, yet they were the first to do it. Prior to Celestia, Mustafa was generally known for his expertise in ethical hacking. He hacked the U.S. government at the age of 16 and was sentenced for it. We get into this and so much more. But first, to ground the conversation, Mustafa shares what he is focused on at Celestia today. My day to day uh, involves lots of different things. Sometimes I, I'm, I sometimes I participate in the research, uh, engineering. Sometimes more kind of like marketing. But um, I'm, a, I'm ultimately I'm an engineer by heart. That's where I kind of started out and we're a very kind of like technical team. And um, yeah, I started Celestia as part of my, which was formerly known as Laser Ledger as part of my PhD um, at UCL when I was focusing on layer one scaling. Amazing. And you have a long history in crypto. Can you tell us a little bit about that history and what really attracted you to the space? Sure. So um, I was kind of like always very interested in peer-to-peer systems from an early age. Like before Bitcoin was around, I was I was interested in peer to peer file sharing systems like BitTorrent. It's like back in the day before Netflix was popular, people used to kind of illegally download copyrighted films and software from websites like the Pirate Bay using kind of like decentralized or peer to peer file sharing systems. And I kind of felt like that was really cool. Um, it was really cool that there was like because a lot of websites at the time were centralized, and this was like a decentralized system that basically allowed people to circumvent um, kind of like copyright laws effectively and download and get access to software or like movies or videos that they would otherwise not have access to easily. You know, and back before Netflix existed, BitTorrent, which was the peer-to-peer file sharing system that everyone used, actually handled like half of the internet's traffic. And so it was like a very kind of scalable system. And so I was kind of like thinking a lot about what other ways can we decentralize the internet? Because to me, uh, BitTorrent was a very powerful example of being able to redistribute power to people because it allowed people that otherwise didn't have access to money to download software that could be used to improve their lives. Like for example, like one of the most pop- one of the most pir- uh, pirated pieces of software at the time was Photoshop, and it was used by graphic designers. You know, at the time it would have cost like hundreds of dollars for a subscription to Photoshop. But graphic designers could download it for free from Pirate Bay and, you know, do graphic design or make money that way. So it was kind of like, to me, it was like a tool to kind of like redistribute power. And so I was kind of like more interested in like what other things, how, what else on the internet can be decentralized? Um, and at the time before Bitcoin, people were kind of thinking about how to create all kinds of like decentralized systems, like decentralized names, names, uh, the, the main name systems, decentralized chat systems and so on and so forth. Um, so when BitTorrent came around, I was actually very interested in that. And I kind of like got involved with the community very early on and around 2010. And, you know, it was, it was a very exciting space at the time. Um, but like one of the main problems with Bitcoin at the time was that there was this one megabyte block size limit. And it was kind of like a ticking time bomb because by the time um, there was a 2013 Bitcoin bull market, Bitcoin blocks started becoming full and the transaction fees became very high. And it was kind of like a very existential crisis moment for the Bitcoin community because the whole point of it was, you know, we're going we're gonna to replace payment systems and everyone was going to pay with Bitcoin. But it wasn't feasible at the time. And there was this huge debate within the Bitcoin community about should we increase the block size or should we just keep the block size as it is and pursue layer two systems like lightning. And that's what, and that's at the time it was like a massive rift in the community. And that's what led to the Bitcoin cash fork where Bitcoin cash forked Bitcoin and increased the block size limit. And the reason why the kind of core Bitcoin community didn't want to increase the block size limit 
was because the whole point of Bitcoin was that it was a decentralized system where you don't have to trust anyone. And as part of that, you can it should be cheap to run a node that can verify the chain. Because if you make it too expensive to run a node that verifies the chain and by increasing block sizes, then it makes it they have to trust the miners more and more. And that kind of defeats the whole point. And so at the time I was thinking, well, like how can we increase on-chain scalability? How can how can we increase the block size? and scale the layer one system um, without this trade-off where users have to, to that moment, verify the chain, need more resource resource requirements to verify the chain. And uh, in, the, in the original Bitcoin white paper, there was this idea proposed by Satoshi called alerts. And the, the idea was, um, he proposed this idea of light nodes, which were called SBV clients in, this, in the paper. But the idea is like um, you can run a lighter version of the Bitcoin node that doesn't download every transaction, but only downloads the headers and trust the miners to only produce valid blocks. But if a miner is producing an invalid block, it can receive from other full nodes what's called an alert to um, effectively uh, force the light client to re-download that block. But there was various problems with that design. So, but it was really interesting, and I decided to kind of pursue that further. And then I did a, uh, I decided to pursue layer one scaling further, and I did a PhD at UCL from starting 2016, focusing on layer one scaling. And we, uh, as part of that, we kind of came across we we, we um, proposed one of the earliest sharding systems. This was back in the time when Ethereum 2.0 was all about execution sharding. And we proposed a paper called Chainspace, and we commercialized it, and that was later acquired by Facebook as part of the Libra team. But I decided not to join Facebook, and effectively, I decided to pursue this kind of like layer one scaling idea further. I decided to pursue alerts and fraud proofs further. So alerts is kind of like an early version of fraud proofs. Um, that optimistic rollups use. But the main problem at the time with fraud proofs was this data availability problem. And this data availability problem had to be solved to actually sell the layer one blockchain. And so I kind of pursued that and I co-authored the paper with Vitalik on how to solve the data availability problem. And then I decided to say, well, uh, and then I kind of realized that data availability is basically actually the core thing that blockchain does. So I decided to think from first principles, like how can we make a blockchain that only does that? And that's basically how Celestia formed. So Celestia is like a very minimal blockchain um, for building blockchains on top of in the form of roll-up chains. Absolutely. So much to dig into there. And for me, it's kind of this full circle moment with Celestia. 15 years after Satoshi, we kind of finally have what a blockchain actually is and being able to publish data and making sure that data is available. It's kind of a simple concept, but it's wild that, uh, you know, and, and you guys, it's been about five years since you've been working on this. So I'm excited to dive into all of this in a moment. And on the block size war, we actually had Jameson Lop on last week. So for those listening, definitely check out that episode to go deeper there. And you touched on this, but I want to double click because I think it's an important concept on just redist the redistribution of power. And that's kind of the passion for decentralization. That's where your passion comes from. But can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, um, when I was a teenager, I was involved with various kind of like hacking groups. Um, some of you might have heard of like Anonymous and Lothic, but I was part of this uh, kind of like hacktivist group called um, Lothic that hacked into various kind of US government and corporate entities. And, you know, for example, we, you know, hacked into the emails of like this federal contractor called HB Gary Federal, and that revealed like various wrongdoing that that company was doing. And at the time I was just like 15 years old and all I had was a laptop, you know, a cheap laptop. And so that kind of, that kind of made me realize that, um, like with, it was kind of like a David versus Goliath moment that made me realize that with access to just a laptop um, and by creating software or by manipulating information, you could basically redistribute power from people that from the powerful to, the, to to everyone else effectively, and so that's kind of like what uh, that's also a big reason why I'm interested in cryptocurrency as well. Absolutely, and can you tell us a little bit about the trouble you got into with that group? And I also am curious to understand your experience, kind of dealing with law enforcement, if you're willing to share. Yeah, I mean, um, 
because I was I was 15 at the time, so I didn't have a big sentence. I was there was it was like something like 80 computer hacking charges, but because I was under 18 in the UK, um, I only had like a two year suspended sentence, which means I didn't have to serve time in jail as long as I didn't reoffend, and then I had something like 320 hours of community service in a uh, charity shop. Got it. Okay. And I know you have an interview on Lad Bible that you go deep into it. So for those listening, definitely check out that interview. Amazing. Well, I want to get into Celestia and kind of understand a little bit more about your inspiration. You shared a little bit about it, but can we kind of go deeper into how you came up with this sure. idea of a, a dedicated chain that handles publishing? Yeah. So um, Celestia was formerly called Lazy Ledger and because it's basically like a very lazy blockchain. It's basically the answer to the question, I was like, what fundamentally is a blockchain? Like, if you strip back a blockchain to its core components, what do you get? And like, what's, what's the laziest possible blockchain you could make that's still useful for developers? And the answer was basically lazy ledger. It was like, it was basically like, what if we just create a blockchain that all you can do on it, all developers can do on it is dump arbitrary data to it. And it doesn't do any computation on that data. It's just like, you just, all you do is just like dumb, it's a dumb ledger. It doesn't have any transactions or smart contracts. You just post arbitrary messages to it. And those messages get ordered and they're made available. And it turns out that's all you really need to build any kind of cryptocurrency application on top of it. Like you can imagine a version of Bitcoin where the nodes, they don't actually execute the transactions. They just, anything goes on the chain, but the execution can happen off chain on rollups effectively, or like on the end user client. And that's effectively how roll-up, how, how roll-ups work, right? Like roll-ups effectively only use the base layer in a very dumb way. Like they basically just use it to post data onto it. But all the actual interesting stuff, the actual execution, the computation, the transactions happen off chain on the actual roll-up chain. So it turns out like, um, and this, and lazy ledger was proposed before, you know, roll-ups uh, were proposed. Um, so the application model was very kind of like primitive at the time, but kind of realized, well, that's basically the, the, the fundamental thing that blockchain does. So what if I, what if we made a blockchain that only does that and scaled it extremely well? And that's where the idea of modularity comes in. Um, whereas like previous blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, they try to do everything. They try to, or they try to bundle everything. So like Ethereum had this world computer model where every single application runs on the same chain or like running on, runs on the same computer. But in the modular paradigm, you basically decouple the, 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 the you decouple consensus from computation. So the L1 is only responsible for consensus and data availability, but developers are free, have more flexibility to define their own execution environments on top of. So instead of like being limited to just you know using the Ethereum virtual machine or sharing the same computational resources with everyone else, in a modular design, uh, developers have their own rollup chains on top of it. And they can define, they have complete flexibility to define how that roll-up chain works and what kind of execution environment they it uses. Um, and it doesn't, have, it doesn't have to share computational resources with everyone else. It's like if 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 one roll-up has high gas costs, that doesn't necessarily leak into other roll-ups. And that's basically a very similar model to how, how the web works today. Um, like websites don't run on the same server as everyone else. You can go on AWS or DigitalOcean and spin up a virtual machine very quickly with your own environment. And rollups are very, very similar to that. They're basically like virtual blockchains. Absolutely. And you mentioned this, but the paper with Vitalik, where you outlined like client proofs of data availability. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you ended up collaborating with Vitalik on that paper? Yeah. So, I mean, that was kind of like a very, in the very um, early Ethereum 2.0 days before rollups were part of the roadmap. Ethereum was mostly focusing on sharding. Like it had this idea where there was going to be, Ethereum was going to be sharded into like 1,024 different execution shards and execution would happen on all their shards and their shards would either be ZK proven or fraud proven. But um, their shards still had a data availability problem because to, 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 to fraud prove a shard, you need to make sure that the data behind that shard was available. And that was kind of like the missing piece of the puzzle to making sharding working. And so um, this was also a problem that I was thinking about with Chainspace to, because Chainspace was also a sharded, a sharded system. 
So then I kind of came. I, I was emailing Vitalik, and he pointed me to this note that he wrote. Um, like it's like a very old note on GitHub from 2018 called a note on data availability, and he kind of like proposed this idea of um, using erasure coding as a primitive to do what's like these data availability challenges. And so I decided to kind of like flesh that out more and kind of like implement a prototype of, prototype of it. And we kind of ended up collaborating on this data availability paper in around 2019. And then after that, I decided to kind of like, re I realized that this could be used as a primitive to, um, like if you, because this is a core component of what blockchain does, what would a blockchain look like that only does that? And that's what Lazy Ledger effectively is. Amazing. And yeah, as mentioned, that process started in 2019. So almost five years. What were the major challenges that you needed to overcome to implement what seems like a simple idea? Yeah. So um, from an engineering perspective, um, yeah, I mean, at the time, yeah, I mean, in theory, Celestia is a very simple idea. It's just like a data availability layer without a smart, without smart contract. So it's like a very simple chain. Uh, but at the time, you know, the tool, like infrastructure was very early on. Like when we started building this in 2020, Cosmos was just released. So it's like that was the only option we had to build a proof of stake chain. So that's what we started. That's, that's what we built on. And um, we were basically had to modify, we basically modified the Cosmos SDK to strip it down and to add data availability sampling to it. And so there's a lot of work involved in even though the even though the chain itself is simple, like it's just a chain for posting data, there was a lot of work involved to implementing data availability sampling. Because the core the thing that makes Celestia interesting is that it's not just a dumb chain where you post data on, on, on it. It's also it does that in a trust minimized and scalable way, using a prim, using a new primitive called data availability sampling, where effectively you can have light clients, like anyone can run a, run a light node on their phone, for example, that does that does this thing called data availability sampling, which effectively allows you to verify the data availability of the entire chain without needing to download all the data, but by only downloading random pieces of the data. And this was kind of like a very new and cutting edge primitive that no one had really implemented in practice um, yet. But it's a primitive that other chains, um, including Dankshawning, plans to implement because it's basically it's effectively the cutting edge of um, scalability. So. No one had implement, implemented this before, so that was one, one of the key challenges of, of, of um, kind of like shipping the protocol effectively. Absolutely, and kind of putting it all together, how do you see Celestia and data availability fitting in to an overall kind of blockchain architecture? Yeah, I mean Celestia basically provides the base layer for rollups to build on top of. Before Celestia, um, rollups didn't didn't really the only option that rollups had effectively for data for data availability was the Ethereum L1, which had extremely limited data availability, or using some kind of centralized data availability committee. But once Celestia was launched, it kind of like unleashed a fundamentally new primitive that for the first time it made it possible for rollups to have access to cheap decentralized data availability. So for the first time now we see. Um, as since Celestia has launched, we've seen various Ethereum rollups, for example, switch to Celestia or support Celestia as a DA layer. And one example of that is the, is Manta, which is a um, OP stack rollup that previously posted the data on L1. And there's this application on top of it called ZK Hold'em, um, and it costed something like you know hundred dollars to play a game. But now with Celestia, it only costs one dollar, so you get this huge um, kind of. 100x cost improvement that made certain applications possible that simply weren't possible possible before on chains like Ethereum. Absolutely. Okay. And the buzzword is modular blockchains. I think you all are responsible for that becoming a buzzword. Uh, can you tell us what is a modular blockchain and how is it kind of new or different from previous approaches? Yeah. So a modular blockchain is basically any blockchain that outsources um, a component to another blockchain, and those components, there's four components, and those components are consensus, data availability, settlement, or execution. So, for example, like a rollup is a modular blockchain because it outsources data availability to another chain like Ethereum or Celestia. And then Celestia is also a modular blockchain because it outsources computation execution to rollups. And it's a very um, kind of like 
uh, evolved way of building blockchains. Um, scalability is one of the main advantages, but to me, the biggest advantage is developer developer flexibility. Like developers previously, um, like with traditional blockchains, if you wanted to make us one small improvement to the chain, like for example, you had chains like Solana or um, Aptos or Sui, they introduced new execution environments that parallelized uh, the smart contracts to make it more to make it possible to process more transactions. But previously, in every cycle, to make to make one to make one improvement to one part of the stack, you would typically have to launch a whole new blockchain that had a new proof of stake network and so on and so forth. But with modular blockchains, like if you want to make if you want to make um, improvement to one small part of the stack. You don't have to launch a whole new chain anymore. You can just launch a new rollup. Like if you wanted to make a more efficient execution environment, let's say like you wanted, and this is like an actual example, like you could modify the EVM to add new opcodes um, to make certain applications possible. Previously, without rollups, we'd have to launch a whole new blockchain. But with rollups, you can just modify the EVM in just in one rollup and then launch it. And that's what certain uh, projects like Curio have are doing, for example, like Curio is a game engine where they modify, they can modify the EVM to actually embed the entire game into as an opcode to the EVM, and then fault proof that, for example. And previously, that would require launching a whole new chain, but with rollups, it gives developers a lot more flexibility, a lot more with a lot less friction. And now that Celestia is live, how do you envision that impacting the future of Web3 maybe five, 10 years out? And what are your thoughts on these uh, monolithic blockchains that you mentioned, kind of long term? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, the ultimate goal is to make smart contracts, sorry, to make roll up chains as easy as de to deploy a smart contracts. It's so like in the future, we could very well see that the default way to deploy new decentral decentralized applications is to deploy a new roll-up chain instead of a new smart contract. Just like how today in Web2, if you want to deploy a new website, um, like you don't, you're more likely to deploy a new virtual machine rather than like use some shared web hosting provider like GeoCities or DreamHost, which was like more popular back in the day, but now we have virtual machines. There's no need to do that anymore. So I see that as kind of, I see that as like a major evolution in, 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 in the blockchain space to make for deploying applications. You know, I still I think there's still space for monolithic blockchains. They fundamentally have different trade-offs, um, but ultimately, it's very clear that we live in a multi-chain ecosystem. So it's like this idea where it's like you have one monolithic chain that does everything. It's it's pretty clear the market has rejected that because it's pretty clear we have a multi-chain ecosystem, and rollups are a very important step to that because if you have a multi-chain ecosystem, it's pretty clear that it's not sustainable for everyone to launch their own proof of stake network from scratch because you're fragmenting security. But roll-up chains are much more practical because they inherit security from a from one uh, base layer. If you haven't already considered building your next smart contract in Rust, you gotta have a look at Sorabon. You can migrate your existing Solidity smart contracts over to Sorabon, and we'll show you how. You can also get funding for your projects. There's a $100 million adoption fund just to drive the adoption of Sorabon. So you can help build the ecosystem and potentially qualify for grant awards up to $150,000. You can visit us now at sorabon.stellar.org to learn more. This is more of a marketing question, which you might hate answering as more of an engineer mind, but I am curious, how did you get everyone so excited about this concept of a modular blockchain? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think we introduced the idea, we, we kind of like introduced the, the phrase of modular blockchains to refer to rollups around back in 2019. And around a year later, around a year after later that it was introduced, roll up, uh, Ethereum kind of switched to this rollup centric roadmap. And they kind of like abandoned execution sharding to in favor of a rollup centric roadmap. And there was this kind of like Ethereum influencer called Polynia, who started about writing about rollups and he started you know, adopting the phrase module blockchain to kind of like get everyone involved. So I think it's partly like it's the Ethereum, it kind of like caught on heavily in, Ethereum, in the Ethereum community effectively. Got it. Okay. Amazing. And then there are other projects, you know, Ethereum's working on their own data availability layer. We have Eigenlayer also providing data availability in the future. Can you talk to us a little bit about how Celestia compares kind of being in the Cosmos ecosystem? <clears throat> yeah. So um, I think all the, I think, yeah, DLAs have different trade-offs, 
but ultimately developers should be free to choose what kind of components suit them because the whole idea of modularism is that it's like we're trying to overcome maximalism and give developers flexibility but um it's yeah it's pretty it's pretty hard to tell at this stage what the different trade-offs are because Celestia is the only kind of like out of the layer if you like that that is live right now um but once those other data layers are live, then it's, it will become clearer what the trade-offs are. But right now, it, it's fairly hyper- hypothetical. Fair enough. And with that, let's get into the fundamentals of how Celestia works. Can you tell us a little bit about how the blockchain functions and then the role of various nodes? Yeah, so I mean, um, I guess I have the idea of like this consensus nodes. But effectively, like Celestia is pretty much like a standard Cosmos chain, except that it, only, it has this kind of transaction type called pay for blob space or pay for blobs. And you can submit, you can, you can create a pay for blob transaction to effectively submit data to the chain and pay for it. Um, so it's kind of like very simple. It's kind of very similar to EIP 4844 on Ethereum, like how you can submit data blobs on chain and you can get it included on chain. So, and then it's based on tenement. So you have these tenement consensus nodes that are producing blocks. But then we also have like this kind of like um, we have we have the tenant we have the core consensus network, but we also have this side data availability network that is kind of like segregated from the consensus network or like separate from the consensus network. And this data availability network is what rollups interact with. Um, you have full nodes and light nodes on those on that data availability network. You have full nodes; um, they serve effectively samples to light nodes. So if you're running a light node that they, that does data availability sampling or trying to get data from certain parts of the chain, um, then they they kind of like ask their full nodes for full nodes for that data. And there's this concept of namespaces in Celestia. So if you're a roll up, you can submit data to it's kind of like a Twitter hashtag. So it's like how you can like if you if you tweet something, you can have a hashtag for it, and you can search for specific hashtags on if, uh, on uh, Twitter. So Celestia has a kind of similar concept called namespaces. So when you submit data on Celestia, you submit them to certain namespaces, and then you can search namespaces for data. So if you roll up, you can submit data to a specific namespace for your roll up, and then all the people, other users on that roll up can search data um, for that roll up in that in your namespace to recon- to reconstruct the state of your roll up. And so you have like these light nodes on Celestia, they can ask the full nodes on the data availability network for data within a specific namespace. Got it. And what do you think about the analogy of kind of Celestia being this Twitter for computers or maybe a bulletin board for computers? Have you ever put it that way? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard to come up with a perfect analogy for Celestia because it doesn't really fit into neatly into any kind of bucket. But I mean, bullet, bulletin board is accurate. It's kind of like a, a you know like a bulletin board um, in the in the sense that like you put you you put da- you you put data on the board and other people can see it for short but for a certain amount of time and that data is kind of like taken off later after everyone can see it everyone has seen it already so yeah I mean you can you can you can definitely think of it that way like it's like a I mean Twitter for rollups or Twitter for blockchains also makes sense as well because Twitter is effectively is also both important. I've actually proposed like someone should um, do inscriptions on Twitter. I think there's actually a project mm-hmm. um, doing inscriptions on Twitter. Oh, very I'm cool. Not sure how Amazing. Okay, nice. And then I would say more of the maximalists around decentralization oftentimes would define decentralization as the ability to kind of verify the state of the network yourself at low costs. So with that, can you talk to us a little bit about compute and storage requirements to run a full validator on Celestia? Yeah, so that's very important to us that um, anyone could run a light node with very low resource requirements. You can actually run a, like you can run a light node on your phone. So the resource requirements for light nodes are very low. I think it's something like you know like you need like something like twenty five kilobytes per second of bandwidth, and you know only a few gigs of disk space. Um, so you might have seen it on Twitter, but there's like this camp- these campaigns where a lot of people are. Uh, posting pictures of themselves running light nodes in all sorts of different locations. Like, uh, you know, we can run a light node on, on your phone on using plane, using Wi-Fi over airplane, for example. Like, it's very low resource requirements. Uh, whereas full nodes have much higher resource requirements. But the whole point is, like, the light node should give you, ideally, as almost the same level of security as a full node. 
So it kind of like um, makes it that, you know, light nodes aren't this advantage in terms of security compared to a full node with higher resources, resource requirements. And to me, that's kind of like the whole point of a blockchain in the first place. Like, like the reason, the whole reason why we're here is to kind of like, we don't want to replicate tra traditional finance and um, kind of traditional corp uh, corporations. In traditional finance, it's kind of generally based around committees, right? Like, mm -hmm. or shareholders. Like uh, in a company, like if a majority of shareholders decide one thing, then, then something can happen. But the whole point of blockchains is that it's supposed to be trust minimized so that no one can rug you, including a committee shouldn't be able to rug you, not even the validator set. Um, and that's why, for example, like in Bitcoin and Ethereum, you no one can, like a validator set cannot collude to violate the protocol rules. It's so like if there was, if there was a government order, for example, to say, Hey, please change amount, please change the protocol rules in this way to print this, to print more money, for example, or to freeze this account or to redistribute funds from this account to another fan account. Um, the validators cannot be compelled to do that because their blocks will be rejected by full nodes. And that's what fundamentally differentiates kind of web three from web two. It's like, it's not just a decentralized database. It's also something where like the end users have can verify the state of the network and light nodes that can verify the chain using fraud proofs or ZK proofs or data ability sampling are extremely important to achieve that. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I do feel like this industry, I don't know if it's from VCs or maybe traditional Web 2 characters coming into Web 3 and kind of masking as Web 3 while putting paywalls up and, and kind of trying to create the same vendor lock that we have in Web 2. Are you seeing that as well? And are you worried about that or concerned about that kind of corrupting the industry going forward? Maybe not at the blockchain layer, but at parts of the stack above above the blockchain layer. Yeah, I mean, um, like decentralizing, building decentralized systems is always a challenge. Uh, like, uh, but fundamentally, I think like one of the core principles of Celestia is that um, off-chain governance trumps on-chain governance. So it's like the idea is like, even if someone has a lot of tokens, for example, it's not a meritocracy. So it's like um, kind of very similar to Ethereum governance, where like you can't just buy your way to, 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 to pushing a, a certain proposal. Um, so, and that's very important to, I think, making very difficult for your protocol to corrupt. And that's why, so one of the key things that we value at Celestia is this idea of um, the social layer. So it's like layer zero is effectively, is effectively the social layer. Like the reason, the, the reason why a blockchain has value in the first place is because people have agreed, agreed to have value. But the reason why the current Bitcoin chain has value and not some fork of the Bitcoin chain is because layer zero social consensus agrees that it has values, has, has value. And that's kind of like a very important part uh, of Celestia, like this idea that the community can hard fork or decides uh, what chain is a valid one. So it's like the validators, like if, so if the validators, for example, or token holders become disconnected from the community, it's enshrined in, into the social vision of Celestia that um, the community has an ultimate say or the off-chain kind of social layer has ultimate say of what is the correct chain. Love that. Governance minimized, I think is so important. Okay, yeah. and kind of double clicking, let's say someone's running a client and queries to find out if a blob of data is available. How do they identify that that's at fault? Like how does that work? And how do they identify that the data is not available? So basically the way it works is like nodes, um, they sample every block for like random chunks. So they say, okay, okay, there's a new block. I'm going to try to download random parts of that block. And basically you can get a very high guarantee, like like higher than 99% guarantee that the entire block is available by only downloading less than 1% of the block. And basically um, if the light nodes don't receive a response to any of their samples, then they can assume that block is not available. So only if the light client receives all the all the responses to the parts of the block they responded to, they will they will know that, that the block is very likely to be fully available. 
Got it. Thank you. And I've heard some people kind of confuse the graph in Celestia. Can you explain a little bit between decentralized indexing and querying versus data availability and how they kind of intersect? Yeah. So I, the graph is more like a layer above. Um, the availability in terms of like the graph, protocols like the graph, they kind of index the data on data availability layer to kind of make sense of it. And it's also, yeah, it's kind of like also people confusing data availability from data storage. So you can kind of think of it like Celestia is a bulletin board. Um, and a bulletin board, like if, you, if you think about a bulletin board in real life, uh, it doesn't permanently, like when you post something on a bulletin board, it doesn't stay there forever. It just stays there long enough for enough people to see it, for anyone else to see, for anyone that wants to see it, can see it. Um, but if you want, if someone wants to see it for longer, then people can store it uh, on like kind of like storage protocols, like Filecoin, for example. But the, the graph um, is kind of like a layer on top of that. It kind of like uh, interprets that data and tries to make sense of it or, and indexes it effectively. So kind of like they can kind of say like, okay, like here's a certain category of, for example, like you can have like a bulletin board where like okay. Um, here's a certain category of bulletin. Like, I want to create the graph to say, please give me a list of all um, bulletins that are related to this specific thing. Like, how many bulletins charge rent over 1,000? So you can kind of think of that like as more like indexing. Absolutely. Kind of organizing the sticky notes on the bulletin board, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, and exactly. with that, can you talk to us a little bit about the developer experience of someone building on Celestia? What does that look like? Yeah, so um, you would usually... So you would basically have to use a kind of like a roll-up framework because Celestia itself is like a, it's just for passing data. So you can use any roll-up framework because uh, we've done a lot of work integrating various roll-up frameworks to um, use Celestia. So you can use, you can build an optimism stack roll-up, for example, that uses Celestia. And you can build a Arbitrum Nitro roll-up, for example, that uses Celestia. So if you go on Celestia.org slash build, it gives you like a list of different roll-ups. And there's also kind of like an, a new set of like non Ethereum rollups that are coming along that are kind of also very exciting. So you have like projects like the Sovereign SDK, which allow you to build sovereign rollups. You also have projects like Dimension with things like Diamond and you have Rollkit, which allows you to build Cosmos chains as rollups. And we also have this new category of projects called Rollup as a Service. So it's kind of like very similar to AWS. Like you can Instead of you can go through like a roll up as a service roll up as a service provider, and you can basically like upload the code for your application, and it can automatically deploy that roll up for you on your behalf, kind of like how you would deploy a virtual machine on AWS. And I would say that's like probably the easiest way um, to deploy a roll up. Like if you go on the like uh, Caldera or Conduit or Vistara website, like you can literally like, click on a click on a web interface and fill out a form, and you can like in minutes you can deploy your own roll up without having to worry about your inf own infrastructure. Absolutely. Thank you. And you mentioned why you chose building in the Cosmos ecosystem. If you were kind of starting fresh today, would you have built it the same way? Um, yeah, I think you would still build it as a Cosmos chain because it's kind of like very um, like aligned the idea of Cosmos, whereas like you have anyone, can, anyone can create their own chain. Like you could also build it using Substrate. But I think like Polkadot is less aligned with this idea of rollups. Like it's more, they're more focused on kind of execution shards. But also, funnily enough, it's kind of changing recently. That people are discussing like how do we use Polkadot as a, as a data bit layer. So this tides are turning a bit. But I mean, uh, I mean, there's definitely a lot of like things we had to redo um, when we were building Celestia. Like initially, we didn't have this idea of a different data availability network. Initially, we tried to make the data availability network. Um, try to bolt it in, into, into the tenement consensus network and then didn't work very well. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of like things that we learned along the way that if we we're doing it again, we, we might be able to do it faster or more effectively. Absolutely. That's always the case. And what about non-engineers? Is there any way for them to participate in Celestia today? Yeah. I mean, you can check out some of the, you can either check out some of the applications on Celestia um, that are live. Manta, for example, is pretty cool. Um, they have like various ZK applications, like it's a, it's a ZK base chain and they have applications like ZK Hold'em. Um, there's also other cool applications on the dimension testnet that you can play around with. 
And you can also you can also run a light client or a light node if you want to kind of contribute to the security of the network. So if you go on the Celestia website, it kind of gives you instructions on how to do that. Thank you. Okay, amazing. And with that, you had one of the most epic launches in 2023. I think actually you had the best launch in 2023. For the teams listening, maybe there's a team listening that they want to launch a network. Any advice for them, tips, learnings that you can share? I mean, um, I think that I think the most important thing is like the ship as soon as possible. Like the ship, I think I think that's good advice for any kind of like startup. Like the ship earlier than later. Um, I think that's like, I mean, for us we're lucky because like we kind of like identified the problem way before anyone else. So we have like the a first view advantage because so we shipped very early. But I think that's kind of like the most important thing. To, to like don't to, to yeah to basically ship as early as possible and um to kind of iterate from there effect, effect, effectively i like that yeah ship an mvp and iterate amazing and how big was your team at the launch around 40 people amazing okay wow and for those listening who might want to join your team can you share a little bit about what your culture is like internally yeah so i think we have like one job opening for software engineer on the rollkit team um, as Celestia Labs, but um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the way I would describe our culture is that there's a like everyone is like everyone is kind of like very well class at what they do. So it's like anyone who joins kind of immediately, immediately learns a lot from people around them, and it's like uh, yeah, I mean, it's like everyone is very passionate about what, about what they do. So there's very kind of like very. It's very high bar for, of quality for work, but so if if that's kind of like something you're interested in, um, like you're very passionate about Celestia and you want to like kind of learn from others who are also very passionate and um, are world class that they do are what they do is a kind of like very good place to be. Absolutely amazing. And then talk to us a little bit about the different orgs that exist within Celestia. You mentioned labs. Are, are there any others? Foundation. Yeah. So there's the Celestia Foundation, was which, which established which was announced earlier this year. Um, and that basically the Celestia Foundation kind of holds the foundation, the, the treasury, uh, or like a big part of the treasury. And is it basically responsible for like, um, has, a, has a responsibility for to do things like grants, R&D grants and, and that kind of thing. And also we, we have a, also, we do have a, like a very surprisingly decentralized core development. Uh, ecosystem. So like there was many, there was a lot of people involved in the Celestia launch other than Celestial Labs. So even though like Celestial Labs developed the kind of like initial test nets, now we have like a lot of other core developer uh, organizations contributing to Celestia. So if we have like Succinct, for example, which contributed the kind of like Blobstream, the ZK Blobstream X bridge, which is like the, the data bridge to Ethereum. And there's like various other kind of like um, project uh, organizations, like informal systems, which were one of the original contributors to, to kind of like to, to Cosmos. And as you know, Vitalik oftentimes plants these little seeds and these little nuggets of what he wants to kind of see built. Is there anything, are there any seeds you would like to plant as you think about grants and things that are being built in the, in the Celestia ecosystem? Um, yeah, I think one thing I want to see is payments. Like, I think, I, I know a lot of people like try to do that before, but I think, I actually think like roll-ups are potentially the thing that actually makes um, payments, because to me, to me, the original use case for crypto is payments, but no one has really cracked that yet. And I think like rollups might actually fundamentally, fundamentally make that possible. Can you share more about that? Because I feel like it's really difficult to infiltrate the payment system because Visa and MasterCard are so easy to use, but I guess they are expensive. But can you share more about your vision there? Yeah, but to me, the beauty of rollups is that they can give you Web2 style UX with Web3 properties. Uh, because like the whole point of rollups is that you can create your own execution environment, and rollups can have extremely fast latency. Like you know, like the, the, the Arbitrum sequencer has faster latency than Solana, like has something like 100 millisecond block times. So you can have like extremely fast payment systems, and um, that competitive with PayPal, for example, and these are Mastercard, and you have it with cheap transaction fees, um, you know, thanks to cheap DA and rollups, and you can make it. So that um, you can you can customize the execution, execution environment to make it more conducive to payments. So like instead of being limited to the Ethereum virtual machine or Solana virtual machine, you can make it more optimized for the specific payments use case use cases. 
and you would just use a stable coin. So yeah, I really feel like, you know, if you do it as a roll up, um, it could like potentially make kind of payments uh, way more usable than they've been before. Mm -hmm. And thoughts on, on stable coins and how we kind of decentralize them while having efficient liquidity. Well, you obviously wouldn't use, do it the way that Terra did, but I don't know if anyone knows how to really make, it's not really clear. The jury is still out if like algorithmic, algorithmic stable coins are even um, kind of like possible without collapsing immediately. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have too much thoughts about that. Unfortunately, it is the case that you know, stable coins like USDC and USDT are centralized. Uh, and jury still out is if, if, if a decentralized stable coin, how possible a decentralized stable coin is. I mean, I guess MakerDAO has been working pretty well recently, but I think most of the collateral on there is USDC, if I remember, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, going a little bit more centralized. Rari yeah. is another one, but they're lacking liquidity. Yeah, jury's still out. I suppose you're you're right. Amazing. And then talk to us a little bit about the technical roadmap. What does that look like? And what are the next important feature upgrades we should look out for? Yeah, so kind of like long-term North Star is centered around three things, which is one gigabyte blocks, uh, one million roll-ups on one billion light nodes. So that's kind of like the long-term community vision for Celestia. But in the short term, it's kind of like a lot, a lot of short-term features like um, various networking improve, networking improvements to make networking there more efficient, adding pruning to the network, um, you know that kind of thing. And we also there's a team working on browser light nodes so that you can run a light node in your browser as well. So the idea is like you can integrate a light node to wallet this directly. Amazing. Okay, and the final question is, how are you defiant? How am I defiant? Well, I think it's pretty clear I'm defiant. <laughs> given that I was arrested for hack for, for computer hacking when I was like teenager. And, um, I mean, that's what, I mean, I think everyone, anyone in web three should be defiant because the whole point of web three is that you want to decentralize power effectively and to, for, and to effectively to create systems that are, um, immune or more or trust minimized and don't rely from, don't rely on like corrupt or untrustworthy institutions or middlemen. And that's effectively, you know, why I'm here. Absolutely. And me as well. Grateful to have you in the ecosystem and congrats again on all the success. I can't wait to see how Celestia transforms the Web3 space and ecosystem. Thank you so much for coming on, Mustafa. Appreciate it. Thank you.